We've covered quite a few features in Nuke. We can now discuss additional ways to play back, and also how to write out frames. Once again, if you're using version 7, you have the RAM preview. If you see the green line on the timeline, that means those frames are stored in RAM, and the playback will become much more efficient. Another way to optimize the playback is to press the new freeze button. This looks like a snowflake. If you click that, then all other parts of the UI outside the viewer and timeline are frozen. For example, a read node will not show the frame number until the playback stops. Aside from the timeline, you can also play back through a flipbook. The flipbook renders out frames to disk and uses an external program for playback. And in fact, Nuke comes bundled with FrameCycler for this very purpose. In order to create a flipbook, select a node whose output you want to see, such as this color correct node, and go to Render, Flipbook Selected. You can choose a frame range and then click OK. Once it finishes, the FrameCycler window opens. This is a very industrial strength tool and there are many options. There's a standard set of playback controls at the very bottom. But you can also do things like crop the image based on certain aspect ratios, or display different channels such as red, green, blue, alpha, and luminance. You can view it in different color spaces through this menu, or just choose normal view. You can even bring in multiple clips. For example, you can go down to the desktop button to see the file browser, browse to different directories, and then if you see an image sequence or a still image or a movie, you can select that. Place your mouse over it, like this image sequence, and click the plus button. The image sequence is added to the timeline. To go back to the viewer, go back down the desktop. Here's my original flipbook, and here's a new image sequence. You can use FrameCycler to do basic editing with multiple clips. Now there are many, many features in this program, too many to cover in a short time, but I do want to mention it's definitely worth investigation. Once you're done with FrameCycler, you can either minimize it or exit it. I'll just minimize it. Now we're ready to write out some files. Before I do that, however, I want to talk about this network. It starts with a read node that's reading in the image sequence. Next is a time clip, which changes the frame range from 100 to 200. Also offsets that by 100, so that starts at frame 0. Note that the read node carries the same frame range and frame properties as the time clip node. It's not unusual for multiple nodes to carry the same properties. This goes to show that there's a lot of flexibility when it comes time to build your node networks. After that's a reformat. Reformat is forcing the HD footage to be the project size, in this case 640 by 480. Because the black outside checkbox is clicked, that places a black letter box on the top and bottom. I want to mention the reformat as a filter property. This property is also shared by transform nodes. What the filter does is it averages the pixels whenever there's a scale, a rotate, or a translate. For example, if an image is scaled down, that means pixels have to be thrown away. If the image is scaled up, pixels have to be replicated. The filter ensures that that operation maintains the highest amount of quality. Let's zoom in and take a look at this man's shirt. By default, filter is set to cubic, and that's a form of convolution filter, which again averages the pixels. If I switch this menu to impulse, I can see what it looks like with no additional averaging. It looks very, very pixelated. This is what you would get if there's no filtering at all. There are other filter types aside from impulse and cubic, for example, notch, which is much more aggressive at the averaging, and several others that offer in-between results. I'm going to go back to cubic for now. Just keep in mind, if you do see the filter, you have the option of changing that property to get different results. And again, the transform node carries this too. After the reformat, there's a hue shift and color correct. Hue shift allows you to alter the hue by rotating the color wheel. Color Correct allows you to change the saturation, contrast, gamma, and gain for the entire image or for just the shadow area, midtone area, or highlight area. In any case, these two nodes are applying color grading to the image. I can see what it looks like without these nodes by shift selecting them and pressing the D key. So here's before and here's after. You can find these nodes in the color menu. There's Color Correct and Hue Shift. So let's write these out. In order to render out an image sequence or a movie, you have to use a write node. You can right mouse button click and choose image write, or press the W key. The write node needs to go after the node whose output you want to write out. In this case, I'll place it after the color correct. Here are the options. The first thing to note is that you can write out different channels. 
By default, it writes out RGB, or red, green, and blue. If we wanted to write out alpha also, we can switch this menu to RGBA. Or you can choose any number of custom channels. For example, under other layers, you have Z-buffer depth channels, motion vector channels, mask channels, and even deep compositing channels. Now, not all the formats can support those channels, but some do. So the first thing to do here is to actually go to File and press the Browse button. Here you can select the directory you want to render out the files to. For example, select the Tests folder. After that, you can enter the name of the file, such as Test5, and then follow the standard naming convention used by a lot of programs. So I'll add a period, then several pound signs to represent the number of numeric placeholders, such as pound pound, which is good for rendering frames 0 to 99. The also supports expression-based numbers. For example, if you enter 0 percentage sign 2D, I'll create the same number of numeric placeholders as pound pound. Another period, and then the extension, such as EXR. Then I'll press Save. Nuke automatically recognizes the extension and changes the file type to match. It also adds whatever options come with that particular format. This is OpenEXR, which means I have the choice of data types, such as 16-bit or 32-bit, and various compression schemes. There are quite a few formats you can choose. You can go to this menu right here and take a look. For example, there's ABC, which is Alembic. That's a new visual effects format. There's also logarithmic formats, such as Cineon and DPX, floating points, such as HDR, QuickTime Movie, and in various standard still image formats, such as PNG, Targa, or TIFF. If you do pick a format here, such as TIFF, make sure to change the extension to match. Also note that there's a color space menu here, and this is automatically set based on the format you choose. Once you're ready to render out, just click the Render button. You can pick a frame range, then click OK. Once the window closes, the image sequence or the movie is written out to disk.